You know, I think truly there is usually one or two teachers who actually push you into doing something which you find very interesting. And uh, I had a chemistry teacher called Mr. Raja Rao. He would uh, encourage all of us to talk about chemistry, the uh, elements and how uh, the history of chemistry starting from Berzelius and Bunsen and people like that. An impressionable age, you can really get uh, pretty uh, excited about this. And right in my intermediate, I decided I want to do chemistry. No experiment, no nothing. It was just learning from the teacher. And uh, there's some atrocious book at that time called University Chemistry by Mr. Mitra. We all thought that's the best book there is. Experimentation and so on were very little, but uh, this was sufficient. I also think it may have to do with uh, the family. Because as I said, my uncle has, you know, he had six daughters. Daughter number three, Savitri, was married to a fellow called Balavankat Raman. Okay. He had just come back from New York after his PhD. The marriage was held in Pilani. And of course, we were all completely gaga over uh, an American return, brother-in-law and so on. And he was also a chemistry uh, PhD. And he was telling me also how, uh, actually he even said, it's more enjoyable to do your PhD in America than in England. So that England, you know, the British uh, PhD, in terms of academic requirements, uh, courses and things of that kind, is qualitatively different. It leaves you to yourself. Whereas the American, I uh, think, somewhat more structured, that probably is more suitable for uh, you know, people like me who are not all that smart, but you have to do. You just, I, you know, you put yourself into, a, into one kind of a discipline or a timetable kind of a thing, and that worked out. And I think that clearly must have been one other influence also. I was a professor of chemistry at that time in the University of Hyderabad. My interest in research has always been bordering between biology and chemistry, what people call as biophysics or biophysical chemistry and so on. Dr. Bhargava persuaded me at that time to come over and join the CCMB, CCMB to be really, not uh, quite CCMB yet. And he said, you continue on as a professor and come over and uh, work in CCMB. And he also said that uh, he is going to get one more person, this time a physicist who turned biologist, the late Dr. M. R. Das. So the three of us actually sat together and initiated uh, CCMP. I trained as a physical chemist, so for me, looking at molecules, studying molecules was just as important as studying cells, organs or organisms. So the molecules particularly protein molecules, and the way to look at them was by using spectroscopy. So for quite a while I actually was doing spectroscopy and also initiated a new form of spectroscopy to look at biological molecules. It was called photoacoustic spectroscopy. 
Dr. Mohan Rao, who was my student at that time, and I did some remarkably nice. We actually looked at the entire lens, eye lens. We looked at the malaria parasite, because these are things that you couldn't have observed otherwise. So, brand new forms of spectroscopy to look at what happens in a cell, what happens in a, in a bacterium, and so on. This is something new. You see, this is a form of spectroscopy where I can take a spectrum of this of this uh, floor and tell you what the components in this are. Okay, it's a very at that time it was a very new form of spectroscopy. We were pushing it in biology. We actually looked at the spectrum and therefore the components of the eye lens because it was easy to get, it was transparent, and so on. And if you shine light on that, it will uh, chemical changes will happen. You could monitor the entire thing. It was a very nice. And that put me on to uh, the lens story. But I should really say, the man who pushed me into doing full-fledged lens biology was the late Dr. Bireswar Chakramarti. He is no more, also a physical chemist, just like I was trained. And we met in a common meeting in our places in Mexico. And uh, I was showing some, some results, and he was showing some results. We began talking, and uh, he was pretty uh, enthusiastic that I should push. In fact, he even came to CCMD. I think uh, that was the turning point of my uh, really taking over. About the same time, a little later than that, I would say more like 1986-87, this brand new institute, called the L.V. Prasada Institute started in Hyderabad. And now comes this man, Gullapalli Nageshwar Rao. And we began talking a little. And clearly, here was a meeting of mine. Here is I am a scientist, very little knowledge of ophthalmology. So ophthalmology is interested in science. So when we got together in 87, I said, let us work together. But I was still in CCME, remember. So we struck up a deal that every day one doctor from L.A. Pratad will come to CCM. And every so often we will come over to L.A. Pratad. But the research facilities are only in CCM. Clinical facilities were here in, in, uh, at the L.V.P. So this went on for several years. I came back from uh, the U.S. to come and join as a faculty member in uh, IIT in Kanpur. We already had several people, my colleagues, senior colleagues, who uh, were fellows of the Indian Academy of Sciences. And that's the first time I actually came to know sufficiently well about this academy. Earlier on, we had kind of read that the academy was started by Professor C. V. Raman as early as about 1928-30 around that time. So, but the first real understanding of the value of the academy came to me as a faculty member in uh, around 1967-68 or so. There are a couple of journals that the academy used to publish. One of them was in association with uh, an association actually called Current Science Association. Current Science was a journal that almost all of us scientists would uh, look at. It is a general purpose journal, but always it said along with the Indian Academy of Sciences. And so that already was a big uh, information source for us. And then Indian Academy of Sciences also had special journals in chemical sciences and uh, since I was in the faculty in chemistry, I was particularly interested in that. And as I said, there are three of my senior colleagues were already fellows, Professor C. N. R. Rao, Professor P. T. Narasimhan, and Professor M. V. George. They were all fellows and so we would, as youngsters, we'll hear from them what all happens and so on. So uh, over time, I think uh, interest more and more gathered in my mind. <laughs> I think it might have been 1981 
around that, I think early 80, 80, 81, 82, something at that time, I think Professor Satish Dhawan was the uh, president at that time, I think. And I think we had it somewhere in Kerala. It might have been Trivandrum, I am not sure. And as a brand new elected fellow, you are supposed to give a lecture. Okay. Before all these Jamba ones, you are supposed to give a lecture. And I was just shaking like mad. And he comes and puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Puch nahi hoga. You just talk like you are talking to your students and so on. And uh, here was another fantastic man. Okay. For him, there was no nothing. There was no impossible. He just will do it. So I think it was early 80s. And that, then I think I became quite active as an academician, running some little summer courses and so on. All the academies. In the Indian Academy, I think I was in the council for two terms. I think it might have been during Kasturi Rangan's time and then uh, P.V. Ramakrishnan's time. And then the offer came as, uh, why don't I become the president of the It also turned out very nicely, it was around the Platinum Jubilee year, okay, during my term. And we started some new initiatives during the Platinum Jubilee. First of all, we will elect a very large number. Okay. Normally, election of a fellow is pretty restricted. In a given year, you don't, you don't elect more than about 25, 30 people. With the result, even very good people have to wait for a long time. And then when you start looking at the average age of a newly elected fellow, it runs into the upper 50s. You don't want that. What you want is catch them young. The same way, C.V. Raman, who started the academy, he selected and elected fellows in their 30s, sometimes even their 20s, certainly in their 40s and so on. So that Silver Jubilee time, uh, Platinum Jubilee time, it became possible, at least as a one-time thing, to elect maybe as many as 75 fellows, just that one year. We did not. We elected any more than about 40 or something. But a very large number of youngsters. And then gender imbalance. So you had to look at if two people are good, equally good, and one has two X chromosomes, one has XY chromosome, take the double X. Okay? That kind of a thing. So you have to do, this is not a reservation, this is what you may call affirmative action. That's something we were able to uh, get in some. About the same time, um, we also decided, along with Rohini Godbole and Professor Ram Ramasan, he and Rohini got together and said, we will actually do women in science, a collection of as many as about a hundred women who are practicing some form of science as well, scientists. And the book came out and they actually called that Leelavati's Daughters. In celebration and in uh, homage to Leelavati, probably the youngest female mathematician anybody ever knew. So Rohini's idea of calling them Leelavati's daughters was very, very good. So some of these were new uh, things that we were able to put together. And then I started a couple of things. See, there are a large number of people in India who are already in their practicing scientists who are in their 70s, 80s, occasionally in their 90s or so publicly funded institutions like universities, institutes and so on have their own uh, rules, regulations or stipulations that you cannot support anybody. So, if you were to have, for example, just like we have short-term professors, visiting professors, we initiated Silla Jubilee visiting professorship for, by and large, senior level Indian scientists who have done very, very well. Okay. This is one. I think increasing the number of fellows and then joint publications bordering between disciplines and so on. These are things that really happen. Okay. And coming together with the uh, other two academies, in fact three academies as well, and uh, joint uh, position papers and so on. We by and large at the Bangalore Academy do not 
come out with position papers on issues of, uh, you know, economic, that kind of thing. We certainly look at only science for science, engineering. These, I would say, were really my arch goals during the time of my three years. Definitely during the British times, India was still part of the British Empire and uh, scientists of British origin had already started something called, which is what is now called the Indian National Science Academy. I think at that time it was called National Institute, something of that kind and uh, that was in Delhi and Professor Raman thought that uh, it would be more appropriate to have a purely Indian academy and Bangalore was the seat of uh, quite a few items of research at that time, particularly the Indian Institute of Science. And he had also already set up what he thought would become the Raman Research Institute and so on. And uh, it was really a personal effort on, uh, by Dr. Uh, by Professor Raman who was able to spot people already even before they became uh, big and famous, he would be able to spot people saying this fellow has spark in him and he just invited them and made them fellows. So already there were two academies, one which was still I think called the National Institute, I forget what it was in Delhi, which is thought to be more, uh, what shall I say, not as independent Indian as the, what Professor Raman wanted. And along the same time, see, <laughs> this is interesting because there were three major science forces, personalities at that time in India. We are talking about the 1930s and 1940s. One clearly was C.V. Raman, you know, which is Nobel and uh, which is towering personality. That was something that was very important. And the second was... Uh, his name was Meghnath Saha, okay. Saha was a very independent Bengali gentleman scientist, did some really remarkable work and uh, he thought we ought to have an academy and uh, at that time Allahabad, Banaras, Calcutta, these were major uh, areas of uh, scientific interest and scientific uh, research. I'm not very sure whether uh, there was enough dialogue between uh, Raman and Saha, but Saha actually initiated another academy in Allahabad. This then is the birth of three academies, the National Institute of Science, whatever it is called, which is now called INSA, Raman's creation or the Indian Academy of Sciences, and Saha and his group which is now called the National Academy of Sciences India or NASI. So we have INSA, IISC and NASI, almost all at about the same uh, time. This really is a historical situation. They are not competitors of each other. They would like to collaborate. But there is still this individuality or ownership or whatever you might want to call it that Whenever somebody proposes, why don't we put all together and just have one academy of science? The, uh, it used to be a pretty uh, strong no. It's probably a little weaker no now. But many of us actually put together the idea that, uh, well, we are all in the same boat. We ought to be able to work together, at least in certain areas. Okay. And uh, so about 15 years ago, I think this theme started. The uh, presidents and clearly the councils of the three academies decided that they can actually work together for uh, several common themes and so on. One of them was, was uh, why don't we have common selection pro uh, procedure for summer research students. These are all 
postgraduate or maybe BSc or BTech at the last year and so on. And as I said, this uh, move came largely from uh, Professor Mukunda who spearheaded this entire uh, and now all the three academies put together, select summer fellowships and so on and it is a huge task. Also all the three academies now have common workshops, teachers training that kind of a thing. And I think the third that uh, most recently, recently in about 2007, 2008 and so on. Again, I think quite a bit because of Mukunda, Professor Lakotia, who is in uh, Banaras Indian University, very active researcher and educator. They decided they will actually put together the three academies for thinking about should we have a four year degree program, what is the value of a BSc, should we consider having a you know a four year MSc program or a five year MSc program, can we exit in the middle, in, enter in the middle, what should be the core content, you know quite a bit of uh, serious academic discussions and syllabus and so on. With respect to interacting with the government, the three academies have been somewhat circumspect and they are essentially because there is this worry and I want to tell you something about this. During my presidency, which was in the years 2007, 8, 9, something of that kind, there were issues of uh, what you may call uh, not just privacy, not just ethics, but also something wrong is being done to a professional scientist or a doctor or engineer, something of that kind, who is an academician, a member of the academy. Human rights are violated. What would you do? Should the academies keep quiet? So they keep quiet just because, you know, they might uh, face the anger or face the criticism of the government and so on. So we thought and thought, particularly in the case of one professional doctor in India who uh, was actually arrested. The case against him was of treason against Indian nation. Now, this was a too serious an affair. While we were thinking about it, the International Human Rights Commission, which is part which, uh, with which the US National Academy of Sciences actually collaborates, said, what are your people going to think about? They said, we, we, we should be able to go on to bodies like the UN and so on. And it occurred to me that this is an excellent chance for us to speak our minds. And so we discussed this and we decided we will we'll take one step forward and that is if I am no longer the president, okay, I am a former president, I can collect a few other former presidents. They have sufficient respect and regard by the scientific hopefully also by the public community. If they can speak out and we did and distinguished uh, presidents like Professor Obaid Siddiqui, Professor T. V. Ramakrishnan, Professor M. Vijayan and so on. This was a multi academy affair, not just one academy. That I think was a very positive thing. And we keep, in fact most recently I think there is now a move to even think about it when you find not just human rights violation, but even situations like when something non-scientific is being propagated, supported and violence happens against uh, rationalism and so on, I think we should stand up and so forth. So the so-called committee of elders is now active. The number of scientists who involve themselves in public understanding of science is rather limited. I can only think of at least in our academy, actually we are much better in Bangalore academy than many other places. I can think of at least 10 people who can do that. Two or three of them are there, made it their lives, uh, uh, you know, full time job. Madhava Gargil, for example, without home, the Western Guards, 
but have already gone out. Okay, even now they are under threat. Okay, the government appointed committee says maybe we will take away one third of them. Now today is one third, tomorrow is another third. So there must be watchdogs of this kind. I'll give you uh, the situation. There is a lot that is being talked about genetically modified organisms. We still have to have, we still do not have this. We only have a government position, an activist position, plus, minus, for, against. Where is, has there actually been a sufficient amount of interaction? One a year is not sufficient. One a day probably is more worthwhile. And the media must also promote this. You probably know, I have been doing public understanding of science for now 40 years. And I have been working with people like Professor Imam Chaudhary who started Turning Point, with MG came in and with Yashpal and people like that. And then we find all of a sudden the carpet is taken away from you because there is no more sponsorship. So media sponsorship is very important. That is not coming along.